I'm a pretty slow learner, but last year gave us a great opportunity not just to learn new lessons, but to recap on things that we've seen happen in the past. So what I really want to try today is to um, point out a few of the lessons that I picked up from personal experience, but also from talking to agronomists whose, value, whose opinions I value, and I'll try to um, explain some of those principles using these diseases. Yellow spot, the net blotches, and leaf rust in barley, because this year, or last year, each one had a lesson for us. The first point I want to make is that low disease in crop does not necessarily mean low inoculum in your stubble. Now, yellow spot and the net blotches are classical stubble-borne diseases. Through the drought years, those diseases were at relatively low levels within crop. But these fungi are very happy as pathogens, but they're equally as happy as saprophytes, so they'll grow on dead straw. Now, one of Lester's students, uh, Brett Summerall, did a lot of work on actually looking at yellow spot inoculum on stubbles and its survival, and yellow spot produced the same number of fruiting bodies on wheat straw, barley straw, and on oaten straw. Oats and barley are resistant as plants, but as saprophytes, they're happy just to colonise that, use it as a substrate to survive through the summer period. The other thing we saw was that in our farming systems, we're maintaining ample inoculum right throughout the, the period, right throughout the drought years. Again, although we didn't see a lot of in-crop disease, we were maintaining levels of disease that, given adequate environmental conditions, could explode in a very short period of time. It really rammed home to me, 2010, that very susceptible varieties are a challenge. They're a challenge to manage diseases in, they're a challenge to protect resistance in other varieties, and they're a challenge to make a quit out of. And I'll use um, some of the barley examples to demonstrate that. The other thing that is important, that if you've got very susceptible varieties, early intervention is a must. Once the train's left the station, once you've got disease established, trying to pull it up in a very susceptible variety is very, very difficult. I won't say much about environment, but you know as well as I do that given the right conditions, uh, pathogens have a, an enormous capacity to virtually explode. Very favourable conditions, high levels of inoculum, very susceptible varieties, it just spells disaster. I make the point of choosing the best fungicide for the target disease. For a long, long time, I've been a disciple of propiconazole because I worked with it virtually when it came off, um, off the production line, did a lot of exploratory work with it many years ago, but it caught me out this year. It just failed to control epidemics, and I offer some reasons why that might be. And um, once upon a time when fungicides were expensive, it was a one spray strategy. They've got a lot cheaper, uh, we're pushing yield limits further, we have a lot better equipment for application, so two or more applications these days is um, quite within reasonable farming practice. Um, I think I've covered most of this on the slide just in my introduction, so I won't go through this in detail, but um, one point I would like to make is that moisture is very important for the development of colonisation on stubbles. If you've got yellow spot in crop, even at a low level, it, uh, the mycelium establishes within the stems and the leaf sheaths and the leaves. Once the crop dies, that mycelium is sitting there. It won't do much more unless it has moisture. And again, Brett Summerall did a lot of good work in actually looking at moisture potential and the development of the sexual stage of yellow spot. It must have moisture. I was driving out here this morning from Warwick and we pulled up and looked in a, a paddock of wheat stubble and you can see the fruiting bodies in the leaves and the leaf sheets, but virtually none have developed to spore production stage on the true stem. So that crop is actually looking for extra moisture to develop those pseudothesia to uh, spore production capacity. I was out at Miles yesterday and I pulled up and had a look at a couple of crops um, on the way back into Dolby. The fruiting bodies there were well established. Uh, it would appear that some of that straw had been standing in water for quite a period, the, the flood had gone across the land, and I'm convinced that that crop was a quite a bit wetter than the crop I saw this morning. So the difference between um, 
ascocarp development or perithecia development uh, in both those stubbles. So what we do know is that the inoculum's out there, both for yellow spot and for the net blotches. And I would venture to say that even given an average season this year, we have high inoculum potential. So be on guard, be prepared, make plans to actually curtail these diseases if they do blow up. <clears throat> it's probably appropriate just to look at the life cycle of this. Uh, some of you people probably know the life cycle of yellow spot quite well. Uh, but it parallels exactly what happens in the net blotches uh, too. So I'll just go through it quickly. Please don't go to sleep on me. So the mycelium is in uh, old stubbles under wet conditions. It produces the pseudothesia on, on the straw. If you look at them closely, they're just like mini volcanoes with little spines up near the mouth of the volcano. When they're fully developed, they, under wet conditions again, they'll actually project spores out of this little opening on top. It is those spores that establish infection in the new crop. They'll infect the leaf. You'll get a small black lesion initially which develops to this uh, necrotic brown and, and then later on as they grow they get a yellow halo around them as well. And then under wet conditions again they'll actually produce spores directly from the leaf and they produce a different spore form the asexual spore which we call canidia. And it's this spore that spreads the, leaf from, uh, the, the disease from leaf to leaf, from plant to plant and from crop to crop. And of course the cycle just goes round and round. I think the big difference between yellow spot and the net blotches is in this phase here. Uh, although the net blotches develop very pronounced and conspicuous pseudothesia, I think a lot of the initial inoculum comes from the production of this type of spore directly from the straw. So there's, you know, they're very, very similar but a little bit different as well. So if you've got temperatures around about 20, 25 degrees C, that cycle is going to um, get your epidemic started very effectively. So how do we manage them? I won't go into this in detail, but I will show you some examples that might um, ram home a few points I'd like to make. Reduce your stubble load. Steve referred to it uh, in his talk. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You blokes are a lot smarter than me. But there are several options out there. And I'll show you a slide in the moment just tells you for why that should be done. Rotate with non-host crops. Your legumes, your canolas, uh, your oats, your barley, all give you options to get away from yellow spot. So, resi sorry. so resistant varieties. And I've got a slide there that demonstrates how effective that can be. I think it's very important you people as agronomists and the farmers you serve learn to monitor crops adequately. That's not driving down the headland the ute and saying, gee, it's nice and green, everything's cool. You've got to get out, you've got to look in the crop, you've got to look down into the canopy because that's where the action starts and it's what happens down in that canopy that translates into high levels of disease later in the season. And of course we have some very good fungicides at our disposal these days too. This is just a chart demonstrating the um, importance of stubble load and yield loss from yellow spot. As I said, it's not new work, it's stuff we did probably 30 years ago. But just to show you that um, we actually applied this stubble to um, yield plots from zero, 170 kilos per hectare, 680 kilos per hectare, and up to about 3.3 tonne per hectare. But clearly, the year loss is almost uh, proportionate to the amount of stubble we put out, 22%, where there was only 170 kilos of infected stubble per hectare. And that's a straw there and a straw there and a straw there. It's not much, believe me. Where there's less than a tonne per hectare, over 30% year loss. And up here, over 40%. This was conducted under slightly artificial conditions where we use sprinkler irrigation to promote epidemics, but it shows you the potential that you can lose in a susceptible variety. In this case, it was banks. I just want to demonstrate how important resistance is. You look at the uh, Leichhardt, the, the, the brown line, and uh, Hartog, the green line. Um, Hartog we'd regard as susceptible, Leichhardt as moderately resistant. Leichhardt was developed from Hartog by crossing in a resistance to yellow spot from a variety out of Brazil. It had two doses of Hartog, and in the absence of yellow spot, the yields are very comparable. 
This data comes from a series of stage three trials that were run across South Queensland in the yellow spot epidemic year of 1998. And clearly you can see that given that moderate level of resistance or moderately resistant variety, it was in the top of every site. It out yielded Hartog up this end by about 16%. Down this end, it was about 106%. But over all sites, somewhere between a 40 and 70% increase in yield could be attributed to the improved resistance in Lyco. There's a couple of points I want to make from this slide. One is to show you the benefits of fungicides in controlling these diseases, and again, this is yellow spot but also to demonstrate the losses. And this probably, um, I almost asked a question of Alan earlier, um, but I'll leave you draw your conclusions from this work. This is some work that uh, Emma Colson and others did down at Hermitage in 1999, the last time we really saw yellow spotted epidemic levels in the variety sun state. And it shows that um, with several applications of um, follicure in this case, we were able to improve yields over the zero disease, uh, the full disease control by 46%. Essentially through controlling yellow spot on those top three leaves, in particular the flag leaf. Where we applied a single spray of tilt at 500 mil, we increased the yield by 42%, the half rate 18%, and the trends were very similar for follicle, but not quite as um, impressive at the high rate. But when we applied 2010 wheat prices and fungicide prices to these values, working on APH2 at $330, ton, $330 per tonne, feed at 200, and fortunately, where we had no fungicide applied, that actually was feed quality because of um, the high proportion of small grains we were able to get a net return of nearly 850 bucks per hectare. And I've had this result several times, repeatedly in yellow spot trials where the fungicides have gone on at the correct time. I know there's some fungicide work going on now with yellow spot, and I deem it's necessary to do some more um, in light of what's come onto the market in recent years. But a lot of those results are inconclusive. And I deem it's because the fungicides aren't being applied at the correct timing. So I think that's crucial to getting maximum bang for your buck out of applying fungicides. I'll just briefly mention net blotches. Um, net form net blotch has virtually gone into recess. I know there's a bit, of, bit around last year, but I think once we got bin along virtually out of the system, it being very susceptible, the situation had improved enormously. We still have Skiff and Grimmett out there in small amounts. They are probably among the most susceptible we have, and Commander coming on stream is susceptible as well. It's not a cause for panic, but it's an awareness thing. So if any of those varieties um, your clients are growing, be prepared for, for an upsurge in, in net form net lodge. Spot form net lodge, we don't have a lot by way of resistance to throw at it out there, but I just want to show you how good we can be. Um, that's come up quite, quite well, but this is from a, a double haploid population we're doing a lot of work with back at Hermitage. Uh, it's a cross between a North Dakotan line and one of our breeding lines out of the Queensland program. But that's the sorts of levels we can achieve with genetics. We can achieve a lot, but that's not in commercial varieties at present, unfortunately. Okay, just quickly, um, any of you who were here last year at the updates, Kim McIntyre gave a brilliant presentation and put this uh, slide up, virtually showing the effects of uh, barley leaf rust in a very susceptible variety compared to a susceptible. All I want to seize on is that in 1990 we did some work with Gus, an old American variety, and we recorded a 62% loss in yield to leaf rust. You think, wow, that's a lot for leaf rust. Well, I think anybody who handled grout crops this year and saw the leaf rust in grout would think that's probably an underestimate. It was terrible, and it's an outstanding case of having a very susceptible variety in the system and then trying to control the disease. Grout and Fitzroy are susceptible to leaf rust, or very susceptible to leaf rust in barley, and I saw some very sad cases. In fact, out in the plain near Brookstead, I saw crops that were sprayed three times and they were still full of rust. The next spray was going to be Roundup so they can get into to summer crop. 
It was just uh, they were too far gone. It's very important if you're trying to control disease to apply your fungicides as protectants. We don't have any that are good eradicants. Your early sprays are going to be more effective. If you can get in, get the fungicide into the plant before the disease builds up, you're going to stand a hell of a lot better chance of controlling the disease. And if you do that, then sure as hell and very susceptible, particularly in the year we just had, you're going to need a second application. I was quite um, taken aback by how ineffective propiconazole was in holding leaf rust in barley crops last year. Um, and it was only after I'd seen just how ineffective it was that I learned that the chemical companies will actually um, make recommendations for other products, for products other than propiconazole for trying to pull up leaf rust in barley. And I'll show you what they are in a minute. But when a fungicide doesn't work, you've got to ask questions. So the logical ones are, why didn't it work? Was the application too late? Was it poor application? Was it loss of sensitivity, propiconazole? And we're getting that looked at, actually. Was it the integrity of the product? I'd think not, but it's possible. I really do believe that probably it went on too late, and the last point there, that there was just such intense inoculum pressure. Very favourable environmental condition, lots and lots of spores, and a very susceptible variety. It's just another dimension in fungicide control. I'd like to acknowledge the input of both Syngenta and New Farm in the next couple of slides, really just highlighting what are their recommendations for uh, controlling some of these diseases. And I'll just draw your attention to the leaf rust. So their preferred options are MSR Extra, Tilt Extra, and you'll see here Propiconazole, not as good as either of those two, not as good as Epoxyconazole. So there's horses for courses. If you look at the new farm data, it's uh, agreeing quite well. Leaf rust, again, the good performers are epoxyconazole and um, opera, a strobe plus uh, epoxyconazole. And for yellow spot control down here, um, again, the opera seems to be the preferred one, but not yet registered. And that's it for me. Thank you. Just all hang on, Patsy. What's your perfect yellow spot time? Perfect. Yellow spot time. Time of application. Yeah. Depends on how much money you want to spend. But if you um, actually, thanks for reminding me of that, Steve. I've got a slide in my computer. <laughs> Many years ago, we did work on uh, apportioning year loss from yellow spot to grow stage, <coughs> whereby we applied disease stubble to. Um, banks in this instance to growth stage 31, took it off, moved it on to plots that um, had no disease from growth stage 31 but, but were diseased from growth stage 31 through to the end, where we had heavy disease in banks under high inoculum pressure, we lost 12.5% of the end yield, where we had um, disease from growth stage 31 through to the crop turning we lost 35% of potential yield. So I mention those for two reasons. One is to, um, I say, partially challenge Alan's earlier theory, um, but, I, but I like the, the challenge to be thrown out for that work because I think we need to do a lot more in this area. And I would really like to do some disease work tied up with moisture stress. I think we'd learn a lot for our environment. Um, but it, it, it gives you a yardstick on which to base economics for yellow spot control. So virtually what those figures tell me is don't go in and apply a fungicide spray prior to growth stage 31. If you do put on herbicide, throw in some uh, fungicide and what that might effectively do is, is arrest epidemic, slow down your production of inoculum so that you're not actually fighting bushfires at the end of the season. But still that money spray is growth stage 39, around about there. You've got to keep that flag leaf, flag minus one in particular clean, and you'll get a, a response like that. We've had responses in banks up to 65% increase in yield from yellow spots. So um, it'll do the job as long as you've got a season to progress the epidemic. Yeah, after last year with drought, do you think we should keep it? Or, you know, are we going to be able to ever pull it up again if we get a season like that? Or do you think we should just um, wash our hands? Um, I would, if, if I was farming, I'd sack it. 
to be honest. But I'm, I'm not saying you should throw it away, but if, if I had the choice, I wouldn't be growing it again. Um, and I'd, but there's opportunity still to go in with it. Agronomically, it's a good variety. I haven't seen much by way of uh, leaf rust in volunteers since Christmas time. So I don't know whether it's over-seasoned at the levels that it did in 2008. Um, another thing that added to grouse problems was that there was a very extended planting window as well. Like some people got in very early with it and I think the last plantings of barley finished in mid-July, something like that. So there were probably two to three months where it had just sequential planting. So you get a little bit of leaf rust in early, it builds up there, goes to the next planting, and by the time you have the last planting, it's just slathered with it. Um, so to answer your question, I would sack grout personally. But if you have got growers who want to go with it, please, please make sure they monitor it. And as soon as you see leaf rust, put on a spray. Um, I saw some grout last year down Moree Way that had um, fungicide applied just prophylactically when the herbicide went on. Virtually no leaf rust in it and I thought it was home and hose, but I, I know it had to be sprayed again because of there's so much inoculum uh, in the system. So sack it, but if you don't, please take care. <laughs>